Hello and welcome to episode two of the Pocket Dojo podcast. I'm Paul Crick. And I'm Asha Singh. Thank you for listening, watching, commenting and downloading our first episode of the podcast last week. Thank you also if you've taken the time to ask us a question. We'll be answering those today towards the end of the show. In today's episode, we're exploring why it's important for women leaders to find their own voice and to reconnect with their personal power. We're talking with Jennifer Hamady from Finding Your Voice, and we're also revisiting Broughton Sanctuary to speak with Sarah, who runs the Avalon Centre. In the last episode, we introduced you to some recent research uh, that we did to understand better the challenges that women commonly face at work. And we also shared some public research uh, by the Bridge Partnership. Paul, I think you were struck in particular about the difference in the language between what women told you directly and what is often appears or is published in, in business publications. What did you notice in particular? I, I think it was more the directness of the language. It's almost when it you see it published in Harvard Business Review or on LinkedIn or in some research, it's passed through some filter. Whereas the women mm. we spoke to, um, were particularly strong and direct with their language, uh, quite earthy at times, uh, expressing their opinions. And you just don't see that. I get a sense that there's a real anger, a real undercurrent in some quarters of the female population that just isn't coming through. And either it's being screened out um, or women are just not having the opportunity to express that. So given the importance of finding your voice to women who lead, Let's go deeper to find out what finding your voice really means. Our guest today is a genuine expert in the art and science of finding your voice. Her business is all about that. A published author of three books, a seasoned professional performing artist, and a faculty member at American University and the Writers' Center. We're delighted to have Jennifer Hamady with us. Her clients include Grammy, Emmy, an American Music Award artists and contestants in American Idol and The Voice, and a whole host of high-profile TEDx speakers. This, though, hardly scratches the surface of who Jennifer really is. I'm grateful, as always, that she said yes, and to be able to call her both a mentor and a dear friend. Before we begin our conversation, I'll let Jennifer share a little more about some of the amazing work that she does. My life has been dedicated to voice in all of its aspects, helping people to discover it, develop it, embrace it, nurture it, and celebrate it. Our voice originates in the root of our being, from the depth of our breath and selves, and extends through the heart of who we are. It reverberates in and through every part and particle of us. The voice hides nothing, it reveals everything. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. How are you, Paul? I'm doing really good. It's such a pleasure and such an honor to have you on the podcast. Thank you for saying yes, as usual. Oh, at any time and always. It's my pleasure. So we've been talking about the retreat, and I know you were one of the contributors to the research for that. So thank you. Um, what we found was that it was clear that women in the workplace, those that are leading, don't need to be fixed. They're fine, they're strong, they're more than capable. But what did I come across was this idea of finding their voice or standing in their voice. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you and share, share your expertise on the podcast was because this is, this is your area of expertise. So from your perspective, thinking about finding your voice, why is that important? 
Well, to me, th those words are very, very powerful. And they are all, you know, I think that that expression in our culture today can be seem a little cliche. Mm -hmm. But I, if you'll indulge me, I think that starting backwards, voice is not just our, our what we're saying, but voice to me, as I understand it, not just in singing, but in presenting, but even living, voice really encapsulates you know, everything that is riding upon our self-expression. It is all of who we are and all of what we say and all of what we hope and long for. And finding, you know, to find your voice inherent in the word your is our, and there's a collective nature of that, which I'll speak to in a moment. I think that's important too, because I think in isolation, when we're stuck in our heads, that's where fear tends to, to ferment and, and exist. But the finding I love, because you've already alluded to this, finding is not learning a tip or a trick or some new skill. It's it's uncovering and rediscovering what has always been there inherent and waiting within us. And so to, when, you, when you ask about finding our voices or finding your voice, that is all that is present for me. And specifically to your question of why is it important, I think that in the absence of finding or uncovering or rediscovering our voice, our self, our essence, our purpose, our value, our determination, our, our dreams, we're not living, you know, I don't necessarily believe in a bad life, but we're not, we're not fully self-expressed. We're not, um, we can't be fully joyful. There's a, a crimp in the energy flow. And so I think it's imperative to, to find that and reconnect with that, that so that we can not just be alive, but can thrive. I love that expression, a crimp in the energy flow. I've not heard that one before. That's lovely. So for women listening to this, and for men too, actually, because I know there's a fair few men that uh, have a crimp in their energy flow. Um, <laughs> if you think about women in the workplace, um, mm -hmm. in your experience, what has been helpful? Because it seems like, you know, it, it, it might seem to some like a mountain to climb. And in mm -hmm. some respects, it's really just in the next door room. You've just got to open the door to connect to it. But assuming yep. that people are thinking, oh, that sounds like a lot of work or it sounds tricky or I couldn't possibly do that because I've been told I can't do that. What are some of the things that you've come across in your experience that, that are helpful as either practices or ways to think or something mm -hmm. else? Mm -hmm. Well, I think a, an easy one or maybe it's, what is that wonderful expression? A simple one, though it might not be easy. Yeah. Um, I think that this is true for women. And as you said, for men, and not just in the workplace, but in every er any mm -hmm. area of our lives, relationships, um, but specifically to the workplace, I think what happens to a lot of women in particular is that we enter the workplace feeling as a starting point that we need to crimp who we are and kind of put on a, a type of act or charade or put on something or bend ourselves in a way to be accepted uh, and certainly to succeed. And I would offer perhaps counterintuitively the reverse. I, in, in practice, it might seem strange and there is a practice I can offer, um, but I would begin that in any area of our lives, the, the fundamentally most important thing that we can do is to make a commitment to ourselves to be most authentically ourselves. And where I think people get stuck with this idea is to be authentically myself, Paul, for example, we'll just talk, let's use myself as an example. Mm -hmm. You invited me so generously onto this podcast and I feel entirely and completely myself. So taking a shower, making sure I don't have a piece of broccoli in my teeth, that isn't crimping my energy. That isn't me not being myself. I can be 100% who I am and comfortable and make choices that facilitate the, the ability of our connection to flourish. And so I think that women in the workplace, in particular men too, to reframe things for themselves to think, okay, I'm going to go and be who I am. I'm going to prioritize and value that that is the a priority for me and has to be a, a commitment that I honor. And then once I'm there, because I'm not 
stifling my energy or expending my energy trying to figure out how to fit and what to do and say and not do and say. I actually have more energy to really take in the landscape of things and say, okay, now what, what can I do on top of my being 100% myself that will facilitate connection, that will allow people to better understand me, and will allow myself to more fully integrate and thrive here. And those aren't mutually exclusive things. So I'm wondering, Jennifer, are there any specific practical practices that anyone watching or listening to this could do? The sort of things that might take 30 seconds, 60 seconds to get mm -hmm. people in a place where they are back to their voice for want of an expression. Yes. Yes, and, and the most simple one, and it's something I, I encourage all of my clients and would encourage anyone who finds himself in this situation of feeling crimped or disjointed, is to, as a practice, you know, you and I have talked about daily practice, grounding, centering, envisioning. And it might sound a little easy, um, but I think it's very impactful. And that is to take, if you want 30 seconds or a minute, and sit with yourself or for us to sit with ourselves of course, out of the workplace, this can be at home, and utilize the power of envisioning to say, well, first, let's, let me reverse a step and say, to first stop and say, am I feeling authentic? I think before we even step in the workplace, there are many people who walking through their day-to-day -day lives maybe have never considered or don't feel that they are allowing themselves or are allowed to be themselves. So that, I think, is a wonderful place to start for those who don't feel that connection to themselves, to sit for 30 seconds or a minute or ideally maybe even five minutes, breathing in and out, belly breathing, feeling the anxiety leave, and just allowing themselves to be authentically within their physical selves. Because as you and I know and have discussed at length, the mind and body are not connected. When there's anxiety in the body, there's usually anxiety, anxiety in the mind. And when we dissipate physical anxiety, cognitive and emotional anxiety dissipate as well. So that would be a first step. Mm -hmm. And then once that has been sort of fulfilled or is, is on track, then to utilize that time, that daily practice to say, okay, now that I'm in a physical experience that feels authentic and comfortable and relaxed and therefore by extension empowered, let me imagine walking into my work space. Let me imagine walking into that interview or into that that office of that person with whom for some reason I feel that I can't uh, express my voice, maybe even find it. And let me imagine what it would feel like to bring this whole perfect and complete person into that space. And you know, for those who are not familiar with the practices of grounding or envisioning um, or centering, that might sound, how could that be impactful in the real world? And what I would offer is that um, neurochemically and physiologically, you know, we as human beings know the difference between real and imagined, but our physio physiological experience doesn't. So there is tremendous, tremendous power in utilizing, envisioning, relaxing, and centering uh, as a tool, not only for our personal wellness, but for our professional and, and interpersonal relatedness and success. That's brilliant. So helpful, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being with us today, for being our guest. Can you, if people want to find out some more about you, we'll put some things in the show notes, of course, but where's the best place to connect with you first off? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And pe please don't ever hesitate to reach out. My website is findingyourvoice.com. And yes, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Jennifer Hamadou, thank you so much. Thank you. Inner and out of nature are two key aspects of regeneration that we'll be exploring in the renewal retreat for women who lead at Broughton Sanctuary next spring. I work with leaders in one of three common transitions. The elder who wants to do more regenerative work where they can bring their wisdom and experience to a stewardship kind of role. 
the enabler, a senior organisational leader, who needs to deliver significant transformation to renew out-of-date structures and cultures to fit with the times. And the connector founder, who is already at the head of a successful uh, non-profit organisation, uh, who wants to widen their impact, but without any of the less desirable aspects uh, that can arise from traditional scaling. In my organizational workshops, I sometimes ask the question, does the outer world create our inner experience or does our inner experience together create the outer world? Now that might sound like a strange question for busy executive teams who are used to delivering in high pressure, often very political environments. Politics are just a natural dynamic that arise in any group of people as they come together and mature as a collective. What's important is how we distribute power through our thinking, behavior, and interactions together, because that's what affects the quality of everything that we create. But let's think about that question a little more deeply for a moment. Um, it might feel that life is something that happens to us, that we don't have any choice. But actually, that's not true. At least the choice might be, how do we respond to situations and challenges? We can only make choices about things when we see what's possible, let's call that our affordance, and then we decide what we want to do about them, our agency. Our inner nature is just that. When we arrive in any moment, we are the fruit of all of our previous experience. We tend to think of ourselves as separate beings with our own ideas, thoughts, feelings, actions, choices, etc. But just as this picture of the forest suggests, we actually exist in relationship to everything else. We have moved through many different contexts. They have shaped us and shaped them. When we're in an organization, obviously we can't just do exactly what we like. And similarly, for me, for example, who I have my own business, I still need to interact with my family needs, uh, market demands, client requests, whatever it might be. Um, I'm part of a network, we all are part of networks or webs of life uh, that influence us and vice versa. The anthropologist and polymath Gregory Bateson famously said, the major problems in the world are the result of the difference between how people think and how nature works. If we take a walk in a forest or an ecosystem, we easily see that there are many different forms of flora and fauna that live together. They both compete and collaborate in order to survive, both as an individual member of the species and as an ecosystem. There's also a natural cycle of birth, growth, dying back and composting for the whole to be healthy. A healthy team, department or organisation need to do similar things. We can create good conditions in which everybody can flourish. And then, of course, at a certain point, some things will need to give way for a new life or other things to emerge. We could call all of this the outer nature. It seems pretty clear then that as external conditions, big things like the economy, climate change, social change, etc., become more challenging, it would be wise to regenerate our inner nature so that we can make the outer one better. Paul, let's talk about personal power. Well, okay, uh, if we're gonna learn a little bit about personal power, then I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take us outside into the fresh air and I can show you a little bit more about uh, a centering exercise that will help you step into your personal power. So I thought I'd come outside and I'd share uh, a centering exercise that um, originates from uh, Sensei Wendy Palmer's work. Uh, so she was a six dan black belt in Aikido and uh, was the founder of Leadership Embodiment Work. And I find this exercise really powerful and very, very simple to do. So you can do it seated or standing. So I've decided to come outside and do it standing. Um, unfortunately, the weather's not quite the way I would have liked it. It's a bit grey. So um, anyway, the way we start, we start with our, our feet roughly shoulder width apart. And we then take an in-breath. We just, but instead of breathing in the top of our chest, we breathe in our stomach. We let our belly inflate. So nobody's watching. 
uh, and just do that. And as it inflates, imagine there's a golden thread coming up from the top of your forehead and just allow that to elongate your spine and lift you up. So breathe in, elevate, and then just allow yourself as you breathe out to settle and come down. And imagine your breath spiraling down through your body, through your legs, into the floor, through your feet, like roots. And then just grip the floor gently through your shoes or if you're barefoot, just do that and then just relax and settle. And then I want you to imagine, I want you to think about a quality that you would like to have more of. So let's say um, ease or uh, a bit more resilience. And I want to, to imagine um, if you consider that in front of you and behind you, how equal are they? And I want you to move your body until you feel that equality, that equalness coming together. And then I want you to think about how does that work from side to side? You know, am I skewed to the left or to the right? And I want you to balance yourself as you do that. And what you'll notice is you'll sink into the ground a little bit more. And then I want you to think above and below. How balanced is that? Are you up? Are you too far down? Are you somewhere in between? And what you're looking for is that relaxed balance point. And I just want you to keep breathing in and out, just gently and force it. There's no need. And then just allow your energy ball to expand. So imagine there's a ball of energy around you and just allow it to fill the space a bit more. And think about this quality and relax into the ground and become more grounded. And it really is that simple. And you don't have to do it standing up outside. You can do it seated in your chair. So there you go. Just a very simple centering exercise. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Can you imagine how our organisations and indeed all of life would be really different if we were operating more from a place of love and abundance, Paul? Now, that doesn't mean, like you said in the first episode, I think, that everything needs to be all sweetness and light or that we're not producing what we need or that we're not creating wealth. It just means that if we were paying attention to regenerating our inner nature, we could really uplift our outer nature. So, you know, everything that we do together and protect our environment as a result. Wouldn't that be amazing? It would. It'd be fantastic. <music> I want to share a story with you all that caught my eye recently about an inspiring woman who's clearly found her own voice and you could say reconnected with her personal power. Claudia Golden is a professor at Harvard University and is only the third woman in the history of the Nobel Prize to win the prize for economics for her work. Claudia has used labor economics and economic history to uncover surprising findings about the changes in female labor market outcomes over the last 200 years. Her work has showed that female participation in the labor market didn't have an upward trend over a 200 year period, but instead formed a U-shaped curve. The participation of married women decreased with the transition from an agrarian economy to an industrial society in the early 19th century but then started to increase with the growth of the service sector in the early 20th century. Golden explained this pattern as a result of structural change and evolving social norms regarding women's responsibilities for home and family, many of which continue today. Many economies around the world today are mixed. We have agrarian, industrial and service-led economies. Golden's work helps us understand how these economies might evolve over time and what lessons can be taken from history to inform the world of work as it evolves to support women today. How about you, Asha? I'd love to share the story with you of a former client of mine because I think her situation is something that our listeners and viewers can relate to whatever uh, organisational sector they work in. 
So this leader was heading up the a very big department in a very traditional male-dominated hierarchical uh, environment where a lot of people didn't see the need for any change. They were quite happy with the status quo uh, and essentially were ignoring the many signals that a very regulated market was giving them that they needed to be much more business focused and in essence, much more commercial. So the biggest challenges that she faced were, I think, to get first to get people's trust uh, sufficiently that they were no longer afraid of losing ground or face or reputation or territory or whatever was bothering them. And then secondly, because of that, let's call it territorial behaviour, uh, was to get them to collaborate across the really strong silos that they created, even if they were just in people's minds. So I really like what she did. Um, she was quite aware of the things that triggered her, let's say, into more directive kind of authoritative behavior about driving the system that she was in charge of, which wasn't something that she wanted to do. Uh, and at the same time, also really aware of, of, you know, what was working and where she could put her energy if, if she wanted to. So the more kind of creative tendencies, if you like. Um, so that's exactly what she did. She created a kind of, she wanted to create a kind of backbone uh, that could uh, pull people with them together. So she started by putting together just small groups of people um, based on common interests or experience or things that they could do together. And so she created this, this group of, let's say, really high integrity people around her who then went out and did the same things in other places. So we could say it's like a fractal that was going out into the system of how to do things well. Uh, and together, they, they really managed to see some really positive transformation going on in the organization. It was fantastic. Excellent. That sounds very regenerative. Now, we've come to the part of the show where we'll answer your questions if we can. Remember to leave us your questions about each episode or things we've talked about already on the show at the link that you'll find in the show notes. We'll take one or two in each episode and we'll speak to them in subsequent episodes. This week, we're answering a question from Stephen Hunt. Stephen describes himself as an executive advisor change facilitator and expert based in Dusseldorf in Germany. Someone asked him recently about moving up to an executive role. The individual concerned is a senior manager who works in IT in a large manufacturing company. This person is already successful and well-liked and doing extremely well. He's been offered a promotion to become CEO of subsidiary within the same manufacturing company. His question which Stephen is also asking us is, how do I know that it's right? His question, which Stephen is also asking us is, how do I know that it's the right role for me right now? Asha, what are your first thoughts? Funny enough, a good friend of mine shared a similar challenge with me recently. So I'd like to come at Stephen's question with, uh, or through the lens of inner and outer nature and finding your own voice, as we've just touched on in the episode today. I guess that from the brief context that Stephen shared with us, that this manager is already well-liked, successful, doing really well, that he's already found his inner voice to some extent. And also, you know, we never really know what anything will be like to, till we do it. So we're going to really be learning through doing it in that way. Um, but I'd like to encourage the manager to think about, you know, first for himself, why is this opportunity important for him personally? What does he want to bring to it? So let's call that his inner nature. What can he contribute? Uh, and then looking, you know, through the outer nature lens, let's say, um, you know, what does this opportunity offer him uh, for the future and, and how's, what's the value that he's going to, to bring with the team, you know, in, in taking it on? So if it were my promotion, uh, there are a few questions I might want to ask uh, beforehand. Just as a good starting point, there are lots of things we could ask, but these are some of the things that, that you know, I would reflect on. So I think about, you know, what's really important for me personally and professionally? What, what kind of leader do I want to become? What can I bring, you know, specifically with my skill set, my interests, my experience into this role? 
And then looking, you know, through the outer late nature lens, as I just touched on, um, what is the strategic importance for uh, the business of this particular subsidiary? What's the direction of travel? Those are the first kind of questions that, you know, I would be asking myself. What would you suggest differently? Um, I think questioning is a good idea. And uh, because of my background, I'd look at it through the lens of the leadership circle framework. I'd look at it from the perspective of what's the vision here? Uh, for what purpose do you want to step up into CEO? Um, what is it that you're going to do in terms of contributing uh, to the world in terms of making things better by making better things? Um, what's that vision? for you, what's that vision for your family, what's that vision for your work, your, your workforce and, and beyond. Um, I think that's the first thing. And against that, you've then got the tension of, uh, which, which happens with some of, of my clients, which is, well, if I, what's the identity hook? You know, if, if I don't step into CEO, that means I am what? Uh, and that's often an interesting perspective to take because if we're one of those people that have always been pushed, always encouraged, always felt like we needed to prove something, that maybe that's not an energy to come from uh, when we're considering a step up into uh, a senior role such as CEO. I think, I think the key to it all though, is to have an exploratory conversation that considers, it, considers these things. I think the inner outer nature idea is a really strong one. So the more perspectives and the more lenses you can look through, then I think the closer you will come to making as an objective decision as you can. Of course, stepping into the role, you never know what it's going to really be like until you're actually doing it. But at least you'll have entered into it and taken that first step with some forethought. Um, and then you're open to uh, shaping that role and letting that role shape you in the way that is supposed to happen. Great. So today we've talked about finding your own voice as a leader and why it's important for women to do so. We've also touched on how we can reconnect with our own personal power and shared some of the stories of women who have clearly done both. We'll be speaking to these topics more in our writing on Substack. You can find my posts at The Pocket Dojo and you can find Asha's at Learning Through Doing. Please do subscribe if you like our writing. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks for a really full episode on Monday, the 11th of December at 9 a.m. GMT. Paul's going to be talking about Aikido and how the principles that he's learned on the mat can be really useful for developing leaders off the mat. He'll also be explaining what a dojo is and why we've called the show The Pocket Dojo. And we'll be talking about how we came together to design the renewal retreat uh, for women who lead at Broughton Sanctuary next spring and what we'll be exploring with you there. As always, you can watch the Pocket Dojo podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, including YouTube. We'll also be on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for watching. See you soon. See you next time. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.